Welcome to the Brain Can channel. And I'm so happy that I could catch you, Mark, uh, today between your conferences, between your uh, book publishing, between your paper publishing. And uh, to be honest, your works uh, really changed my life because I was late quite often and quite everywhere. <laughs> And uh, as soon as I met with your research about inner timing and how we sense time, it uh, helped me to manage myself and to change some things that is really um, beneficial now for me. So thank you for your research and thank uh, you for coming. Um, I studied your CV and I found that uh, you studied and worked as a clinical psychologist, as a neuropsychologist, as a psychiatrist. And uh, I would like to ask you um, to describe the differences between clinical psychology, psychiatry and uh, neuropsychology and neuropsychiatry. Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, I, actually I would say differently. So I am an uh, experimental psychologist yeah, from training and I also studied philosophy, yeah, which is uh, an important part of my uh, research that I not only just do empirical research, but I also try to get an understanding of what I'm doing. So therefore philosophy is important. And then I uh, studied um, or did my PhD uh, in the medical department um, uh, in at the University of Munich uh, and did my degree in medical psychology. Uh, actually called human biology the degree, but it was in the medical psychology institute with uh, Ernst Pöppel. And there for my PhD, I studied with brain injured patients uh, and studied how their perception of time uh, changed um, due to an infarction to the brain or at cancer, uh, so brain cancer in certain areas of the brain. And uh, so I would consider my, myself, you could say, as a neuropsychologist, an experimental psychologist. Uh, at some point, I went uh, to uh, the University of California, San Diego, UCSD. And um, there I studied in the Department of Psychiatry, so as a postdoc, and did fMRI research, uh, do, uh, looking at time perception uh, in healthy individuals. And then basically trying to find out which brain areas are responsible or are related to our sense of duration of passage of time. And uh, yeah, so uh, I would consider myself an experimental psychologist or cognitive neuroscientist, you could say, with a leaning to philosophy. Time perception came into your life uh, quite early. So was it uh, uh, love from the first sight? How did you come to this topic? So, of course, uh, uh, I remember when I was five years um, that I, as a child, that I had a discussion with, we had a discussion with some other people. We were all exchanging our ages, yeah, how old we were. And I remember that I was very proud to say I'm nearly six. I'll be soon six years of age. So that's maybe the first memory where something like time or age and time came into my uh, consciousness, or I rem still remember. But uh, to study time perception was, was started actually with my PhD. So a little earlier, because I did an internship at this Institute of Medical Psychology in Munich. And that's where I came into contact with this the scientific um, uh, yeah, research on time perception. Uh, I did this internship, then I finished my um, degree in psychology uh, at the time that was in Fribourg, Switzerland. Then I went to Munich, which is actually my hometown and uh, in Germany, and there I then did my PhD. And this was with uh, looking at time perception changes in 
patients with brain injury, and that's how, how it started. And but and but you could say with uh, falling in love with the subject, actually you could say something like this because how did they come into contact with the institute, with uh, the Institute of Ernst Purple, who sorry for um, my cat. Did. Even I'm, she's interested in time perception. <laughs> just I'm just so near to the the microphone. At least, uh. <laughs> yes. And um, yeah, so I was there in, in Fribourg in Switzerland and I read the internship paper of uh, a student of mine, a colleague of mine. Um, and there I saw, oh, he had been at the Institute in Munich and he did work on time perception on time perception and I said oh yes I also have to do this yeah I want to do this time perception that's really interesting because uh, frankly speaking in experimental psychology or cognitive psychology a lot of things are very boring actually if you study them but with time perception I was really uh, thrilled and then that's how I went to uh, the institute and studied time perception and started and I'm still doing it now um what is what is the time actually concerning the brain? Um, so, concerning the brain. Well, first of all, I would say um, time, let's say, through our faculty of timing and time perception, similar to spatial perception, we organize, you could say, the uh, input we, we get. Uh, through the senses, yeah. This is like a, actually a Kantian, Kantian view by Immanuel Kant that we need the faculty of time and space to be able to um, to perceive, yeah. And also not only passively to perceive, but actually actively um, be in the environment, showing motor actions, um, actually actively searching the environment actually first of all actually we are actively searching but with these categories of time and space and that's how we understand world with an active search of the world in space and time so we need temporal order of events to understand what's happening what first happened first what happens next this is also important for understanding causality yeah so you have a billiard ball this this one came and then it hit the other billiard ball and so there's a temporal order of events which we, which we need. Uh, certain durations, we have to discriminate certain durations, for example, just for understanding a language, uh, a, um, spoken language. Certain phonemes have uh, mainly characterized by different uh, durations. That's actually what I did for my, my PhD, uh, looking, for example, da and ta. These two are mainly characterized that the certain component of the speech signal at the, at the beginning is longer for da than for ta. And that's how we can make the difference, sense the difference between da and ta, which is, of course, important for uh, language understanding. So you, so you see temporal order, duration, etc., are important for interacting with the world, it's a being sensory motor mode with the world that what we interact now how we interact now yeah although it's just through a video uh, conference is also related to timing because you know when i stop with my uh, with my sentences you take up and continue talking so we are actually also now already in some sort of rhythm yeah in a language yes. rhythm yeah or communication rhythm actually yeah but uh, time perception is also more, yeah? I would say time perception is uh, important, for example, even in a more passive sense of that we sense, hmm, this really takes, something really takes long. The, let's say the lift is not coming or the waiter with the food is not, not coming. Something is wrong. And then we start to react to some sort of change the situation. Yeah? So uh, time is of essence uh, in anything we do. And to plan, to plan in our, our actions and... Uh, yeah, uh, that's of course an anticipation, yeah, I'm planning actions in a short time range, but also on a longer time range, yeah, that's, that's of course uh, very, very important, yeah. If we talk about time perception, uh, can we talk about specific brain areas that actually encode this uh, duration, sense yeah, of so duration and sense of order? Mm -hmm. So, uh, sense of order, um, that was actually the, now the output of my um, a PhD thesis with the brain injured patient, that mainly those uh, patients with injuries to the left hemisphere 
in the temporal cortex um, and which is related the damage there in these patients was related to aphasia so the um, problem of understanding language um, that also also those patients had a problem in detecting temporal order right so they needed longer intervals between two events for example two click tones to be able which were presented to the ears via headphone to be able to say which one of the two clicks was presented first the left or the right mm -hmm. So they needed longer intervals between before they were able to correctly tell the temporal order. So this could be an indication. Then other uh, studies later showed the same thing also with uh, um, uh, EEG measures yeah, and localization um, uh, methods that it's more the left hemisphere on this temporal parietal cortex uh, so more in the back of the, the brain that is responsible for temporal ordering in this milliseconds range. Um, but then let's say duration perception, there we have to make a distinction between two different um, uh, perspectives. One is experiencing duration at the present moment, yeah, now, yeah, when you are presented with, this, with a certain duration and you have, to, for example, to reproduce it or you have to judge it as long or short or whatever um, versus um, uh, looking at time or judging duration in retrospect so retrospect meaning you didn't attend to time but now suddenly uh, you're uh, making a time judgment for example subjectively how long did our conversation now last yeah, now i can look at the clock so i know how long it lasted but without a clock still we can make an a guess or have a rough estimate of duration yeah and this is more retrospective and that, that is depending on memory and, uh, and it has been shown by roman colleagues uh, of mine that within humans that this retrospective uh, time perception uh, is related to hippocamp the hippocampus hippocampal regions which are are known to be uh, important for uh, encoding events into memory so it's important for memory and that of course makes sense because looking back at something how can we tell time because we are judging uh, events that passed how many events passed etc and that's why the hippocampus uh, is so important uh, but the more being in the present moment now judging duration uh, um, uh, is more related to uh, psychologically speaking or experiential speaking to uh, the to interception to the, the feeling of yourself to your bodily self yeah? what does it mean for example we're waiting for a bus and it's not coming and we feel a little nervous because we have to catch a train and then we are much reflecting on ourselves and we feel this fear in us we feel uh, our body and then what happens time stretches duration stretches yeah? And but if you let's say in a conversation, a nice conversation with uh, someone waiting for the bus, and we just not relating to ourselves, we're forgetting ourselves, then time passes very quickly. And uh, related to the brain, the question uh, the what I showed actually in 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 San Diego and use at the UCSD with fMRI research, yeah, looking at uh, brain activity, was that the insular cortex is responsible for this. A present moment awareness of duration and uh, the, what is the insula the insula is the primary interceptive cortex so interception meaning the feeling the inner bodily self yeah, the breathing the heart rate maybe um, the if you have a stomach ache if you feel tired if you feel cold hot thirsty etc if you feel pain this is all body signals that, that are received by the insular cortex and this region also showed to be primarily involved in time perception of duration of seconds, many seconds. Um, and this shows that maybe our sense of time comes from our body signals. Yeah? The more body signals we receive during a time uh, interval or more, yeah, and maybe are also more through more arousal because we are more angry or happily aroused or through boredom because it's totally attending to ourselves, our bodily self, and then time uh, stretches. Yeah? So insula um, and interception are important for sensing time at the present moment.
since our emotions uh, can uh, drive uh, this uh, uh, inner time sense or time perception can for example attention or motivation if we are motivated to do something or if we are focused on some event can this also uh, shift uh, this time perception uh, yeah so so exactly so i think there's two two components which are uh, important one is uh, attention regulation yeah the question is where do we attend do we attend to time or are we distracted from time so if we attend to time, then actually time passes more slowly. The classic waiting situation, the boredom situation. Huh? But if we're distracted from time because we're in an interesting conversation, uh, just like now, or we're... Like the biggest time killer is actually going into the internet and browse the internet and, uh, let's say, jumping around the different news and, and then also the different messages you receive. Um, or scrolling, scrolling. Is it like around, exactly. <laughs> yes. And then you are distracted from yourself and uh, from time, and therefore uh, time passes very quickly. But if you're, let's say, attending to time because you're waiting for something to happen, then you feel yourself and time expands. Just imagine how it is crucial that time actually lives in us. Yeah, yeah, not in mathematics, because you know, one time it was really popular to say that uh, universe uh, doesn't has time, and time is invented by mathematicians. Mm -hmm. I really like to support this idea when I was late. <laughs> the time doesn't exist, but uh, now, based on uh, what you are talking, uh, I can understand uh, that time uh, is really uh, lives in uh, our body, and that uh, our connection to ourselves and our body, our body awareness, is uh, fundamental for actually time perception. Yeah, I mean, that's nicely formulated. So you could say, um, we are time, we with our bodies, we are time, or I am time, Yeah, with my body and with my emotions, uh, with my self-awareness, I am basically time. Thank you very much. So we talked about um, natural things that can shift our uh, time perception but uh, since you worked a lot uh, with uh, pathologists could you please tell when this shift is so big or significant then we can talk already about pathologies and which protocols do you use to uh, understand if the person is uh, healthy or if it uh, or this uh, person has to be uh, medicated for example mm -hmm. um, so i myself i uh, studied um, when i was at, in san diego in the veterans affairs medical hospital um, I studied uh, patients with drug dependency. Yeah? And they, later I did cooperations with um, psychiatrists, for example, in Strasbourg with Anne Giersch, who studies schizophrenia, or with Kai Vogelei, who is a psychiatrist in Cologne, who studies a patient with depression or with autism. And so, what, and with all these, um, uh, yeah, different pathologies in mind uh, important for psychiatry and clinical psychology what one could say is that a lot of there is of course subtle differences and but if i want to make a summary of we you now we have to speak i think of uh, more in a way of summarizing things is that in a lot of pathologies uh, psych psychiatry pathologies people have an overrepresentation of self and time yeah so meaning, uh, so one of the most frequent words that patients with anxiety or depression voice is, is I, me, I, me, I, me. So everything is revolving around themselves due to their uh, pathology yeah? in the sense of that they are feeling depressed, that they are anxious. So their, their self, their anxious, their depressed self is some sort of upregulated. And at the same time also, uh, time is upregulated. So, so for example, uh, Kai Vogelei, uh, with a very nice interview study with uh, patients with depression, what they showed, and David Vogel, who was the PhD at the time, uh, what they showed was in these interviews that people with depression 
feel stuck in time, that the future is far away, that they cannot reach the future, that they are stuck here in the here and now, and time drags. And this is also, for example, when with the patients with um, drug dependency, which were now in rehabilitation when I tested them, so they had, let's say, a history of years or sometimes decades of cocaine or methamphetamine addiction plus alcohol addiction, etc. Yeah? Always also, of course, <laughs> tobacco addiction that comes always uh, with these other addictions. And then they're just for two, three weeks, they're some sort of off the drug. But of course, still the whole brain is different, um, is changed through this addiction. And they also overestimate duration. I could actually even show this um, with experimental psychology tools where people really had to judge a duration, actual duration. And they overestimated these durations in several tasks, also computerized tasks, but also in a task where just let them wait for a while and then asked how much time had passed. So this shows due to this drug addiction to um, uh, psychiatry issues like depression, the self is upregulated and also then time is upregulated in the sense that time passes very often in many situations more slowly uh, for these patients. You know. Mm, I have a question about uh, people with addictions. Um, if we have patients, for example, with alcohol addiction and patients with drug addiction, do they have different uh, shifts in time perception? Or if person have some addiction, for example, addiction to video games also is, a, is a one, one uh, form of addictions or they have just general shift and uh... um so what what could be what you mean maybe with general shift is that um there if we measure this is that uh, in a lot of these uh, groups of individuals um uh, that impulsivity is upregulated they are more impulsive um, and uh, so in many uh, patient groups, the impulsivity levels are higher. And what is the definition of impulsivity is basically uh, related very much to time. It means you cannot wait for something to happen. That is basically a definition of impulsivity. So you want something, a reward, and you hardly can wait for it to happen. Yeah? So if you're more self-regulated, more self-controlled, you can say, okay, I like this very much, but at the moment I cannot get it, but I stay calm and wait until it comes but impulsive people they want something now and because they want something now they also then you could uh, argue um they are more focused on their self and on time and therefore for them time um uh, expands so that means in a, and that's has been shown a lot of times that more impulsive individuals overestimate duration presented duration uh, that's like a characteristic of these patient groups and so that's that's what you find in many many psychiatric psychiatric patients and this was also what i found in uh, the patient with addiction so with stimulants addictions that actually it was like a mediation you could find uh, that drug addiction led to more impulsivity and this impulsivity led to an overestimation of duration if we talk about uh, personal traits, for example, or personality, because you can sometimes meet uh, impulsive people that don't have any uh, addictions, mm -hmm. um, can they manage this impulsivity in respect to time perception and body awareness and uh, focus on their selves? Yeah, so, so, in, uh, well, so we did a very mean study, yeah? Uh, where we invited people to come to uh, our laboratory to our institute and uh, we we said to them so we took off their cell phones their books any reading material anything that could distract them from time um, um, and then we told them oh our computer in the, in the next next door where we want to do this computer task with you crashed please wait here until we fix the problem huh? And so they were alone in a very boring waiting room. And, <laughs> How uh, to judge impulsive people. <laughs> uh, yes, well, that was what we wanted. But we were some sort of not that mean because we just had the people wait for exactly seven and a half minutes. Uh, 
So they were in this room alone, had no ways to distract themselves. And after exactly seven and a half minutes, the experimenter came back and then revealed this cover story, yeah, that it was a fake story, um, and asked them, so how long do you think you were alone in this room? How did time pass for you? Um, how did you feel? What was your boredom level? And, and other questions. And uh, there we found very clear correlations between the more people attended to time, the more bored they were, uh, the more they overestimated duration and the slower passage of time. But we also had uh, beforehand um, measured uh, trait impulsivity. So with questionnaires, people filled out um, what they thought about themselves re regarding impulsivity, how they reacted normally in daily life. And there we also found then this significant correlation that the more impulsive people were, and that's also you could say a mediation analysis, the more impulsive people were, the more they attended to time, the more they also felt bored, and then the more, and then the slower uh, subjective passage of time during these seven and a half minutes. Uh, so this was a very neat um, uh, uh, study where we, no, not very surprising because we've uh, experienced these things uh, from uh, from everyday life, but um, we now quantified them and could really show all these relationships. Um, and then in a second study, we also looked at uh, self-regulation capacities. So, so you could say on this two-dimensional extreme, you could say massively impulsivity, ma massive impulsive, and then on the other side of this duality, you could have self-regulation. So people who are highly impulsive are not very self-regulating, have no self-control. People who are very self-controlled, they are not very impulsive. So we did the same thing again also, but now looking at self-regulation capacities. And what, there we could show um, people who are more able to self-regulate. That means that if you're sort of like blue, feeling blue, if you're more a little bit depressed, you, you're able to get yourself out of this um, situation and feel better. But also, well, let's say, if you're highly elated, something happens, you also can self-regulate yourself a little down if it's uh, if you have to. Uh, part about impulsivity and self-control, uh, part of that really helps me to manage my uh, my lateness <laughs> everywhere because I'm naturally, I'm a very impulsive person and uh, how it affects my time management. Since uh, if I have something boring, time uh, starts to stretch for me and uh, I have mistakes in planning because of this, because I think that I have more time, but in reality I have less time. So this is uh, when I started to control myself and uh, always back to the real situation and to the real time and really it, it changed my life for better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. So, I know that you worked a lot with the altered states of mind. Uh, could you please t uh, tell what is it exactly if we talk about altered states of mind? In normal state, in pathologies, so please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so I mean, why, or why do I study it? First of all, I study it also because it's some sort of fun to do that. Yeah? Uh, inducing alter states of consciousness and, and uh, doing research on this because I also if you experience it yourself yeah you get curious about what is this yeah? and but There's then the whole science about fun yes yeah <laughs> I agree. Yeah, yeah but uh, some people just use it like a job the scientist as a job and then uh, no, no, but this this the topics they uh, have are not so much fun I always think yeah? um, so um, so. But then why I also, from a um, rationality point of view of why I do this in the context of my research is because in other states of consciousness, what happens, so we just talked about the self and time, how it is related through the insular cortex for sensing yourself, your body self. What happens in these other states of consciousness very often is that you lose your sense of self and of time. Yeah? So, for example, uh, as opposed to boredom, what we just talked about, when you're in uh, flow states, yeah, because you're totally focused on something you're doing, uh, which could, which is very often something fun you, you like to do. It could be mountain climbing, doing sports. It could be in music with people in a band. 
but it could also be work yeah because you're sit you're sitting on a on a text and you really want to do this and it's it's a great thing for you to do and then in these flow states um uh, then you lose your sense of self and time yeah or you think oh what's this already that amount of time has passed yeah so we also did this with virtual reality games so we had people come into uh, in our lab and we had a virtual reality lab there and have people play a very dynamic video game in virtual reality so they're totally immersed in what they're doing and what we found out is then uh, with flow questionnaires how much they were in flow um, assessed the more flow people uh, reported the faster passage of time uh, during this video games yeah it totally makes sense it's nothing super surprising but again we quantified this yeah and showing them now experimentally and with quantified data that is really the more flow the less or oh, the, the faster passage of time yeah so again this correlation yeah we will have yeah? and and then but you can go in into look at other uh, um uh, modes of inducing altered states of consciousness. So one thing we had in, in our uh, lab, very um, experienced meditators meditate in our lab. And we also looked at heart rate and breathing rate and uh, what we could versus a controlled situation where these very same uh, meditators were in the same position and also and meditation seat sit and, and then they read a little passage of a calm text as a control condition and what we could show there is that again during their meditation where they were totally immersed in their meditation uh, afterwards when we asked them they also also report that time passed very quickly they underestimated duration and their sense of body boundaries um, went away so again this correlation between sense of self and and of time and one so more one more yes yeah? Yeah, yeah, one more, just one more. Uh, so, uh, for example, a lot of people have uh, problems in um, with meditation. Why? Because they very easily get bored and uh, then they feel their body self and time drags and oh, when does this end, you might think. Yeah? But there's a way, what I call instant meditation, for example, through the flotation tanks. So flotation tanks are these tanks where you lie in water which is has your body temperature and you float in it because it's highly saturated uh, with epsom salt salt and so you like in the dead sea you float in this water and feel totally relaxed it's body warm because it's exactly 35 degrees so it has your skin temperature so you lose your sense of your outer self with the environment and you're there it's dark you don't it's, it's light is switched off you can always switch it on again but then it's just switch it off it's dark you don't hear anything you're totally relaxed and you totally lose your sense of time and again again your body's uh, um, body self boundary some sort of this there's a diss dissolution of those so again this shows in these different altered states that the the that you lose your sense of self and time and that, that's what that's why uh, i like to study uh, these different induction methods because then i learn something about how we sense uh, time and our and it's important for understanding basically self consciousness a couple of years ago there was a paper about uh, meditation where um, researchers uh, picked up a really experienced uh, meditators so they have an average experience of 10 years uh, of uh, meditation as permanent practice practice uh, so when they really found that uh, during this meditation people uh, starts to lose uh, their body awareness uh, they have changes in time perception and uh, they also measured how brain works uh, within this state and they found that uh, there is like a um, short disconnection between thalamic regions and between cortex. So thalamus generally is responsible for sensory information. And uh, if uh, these signals uh, uh, accelerate, so uh, the person start to feel the stretching of time and uh, it works vice versa um, since you also did uh, the analogical work 
could you please uh, comment something about this? Do people really have this small disconnection between regions and alteration between thalamic regions and cortex? Um, but I mean, um, this sounds uh, plausible because the thalamus is also uh, the not only the point where the sensory signals from the eyes, the ears, etc., except for smell, um, enter the, the cortex. Yeah? But it's also important for the crosstalk uh, between different regions of the brain. So mm -hmm. if there is less crosstalk um, between regions of the brain, um, this fits well with um, uh, other findings with um, altered states of consciousness. Uh, for example, you find it with flotation, well, the flotation tank. So colleagues of mine from Tulsa with Justin Feinstein in the lead, what they showed was that after the floating tank, where they, what they just told you, where they were in this tank and relaxed for an hour. A burning state, went, actually. Hmm? Did, did you think about this? This is uh, actually the state that is very close to the embry em embryonic state. Yes, yes. People discuss it in this context. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people say that you can get into the states again you had uh, uh, when uh, Natal, yes. birth, Yeah. So people discuss it in this context. Yeah. Um, but in this case, what they showed was they had people going into the fMRI uh, before flotation, and then after flotation again they went into fMRI, just recording um, uh, the brain and basically the fluctuations of the brain, and what they show the brain activity. And what they showed uh, was that, um, uh, especially in a certain uh, brain region, the PCC, the posterior um, cortex, uh, um, that there, these, the PCC connections to other brain regions uh, uh, was um, less strong. So the crosstalk between the PCC and other brain regions was diminished. And this, the PCC is very uh, important also um, for our narrative self, for realizing ourselves. So, so this is one indication uh, that um, through uh, the flotation tank, yeah, we, the sense of self is diminished. And a very similar uh, a result also appeared with a even more strong induction method for altered states of consciousness. Um, uh, with psychedelics. So people, again, while they were under the influence of psychedelics like psilocybin or LSD, this was uh, studies conducted at UCL, University of College London, uh, with uh, two researchers, Carl Harris and Nutt. And they showed uh, that, again, the PCC, yeah, the connections between PCC and other regions were downregulated. Yeah? So this means in altered states of consciousness, you could say um, that this crosstalk be between certain regions, in this case, uh, regions which are important for your sense of self are downregulated. And then you so, have to experience this uh, flying time, right? Uh, yeah, that, that these uh, individuals didn't look at uh, subjective time, unfortunately, uh, but uh, of course, theoretically, because what we showed with the flotation tank is that the sense of self goes down and also uh, you, you have a time distortion, subjective time distortion. Yeah? So these go hand in hand. So there could be a relationship between uh, this diminished crosstalk in these brain regions and uh, subjective time. Speaking about meditation, this is very important and popular now uh, if uh, we talk about mental health and mindfulness. Could you please uh, tell something about how meditation helps in helps us to stay mindful? Uh, yeah, so, so this is actually a, a um, part of the research um, related to what I said earlier um, with this overrepresentation of self and time in patients with depression, anxiety issues, uh, also uh, drug addictions. Be and because, uh, and, and this is not, we also talked about more impulsivity. Yeah? So in, in 
daily life we experience this. If we're more stressed, for example, then also our sense of narrative self is upregulated as our se sense of time. For example, we're like like mad because we someone said something about us we didn't like, and then suddenly we have all this narrative self, this, this rumination is going on. So meaning that our sense of self is upregulated. Yeah? And then what mindfulness meditation, what mindfulness meditation is good at is because you get go into the present moment of what you experience right now, this decreases then uh, this sense of narrative self. Yeah, all what you, because, because the narrative self means, oh, I'm remembering what this guy said last yesterday mm -hmm. to me. Yeah? And uh, this is nothing to do with the present moment, but it's actually memory. It's the past. Or I'm anxious about something that might happen in the future. Let's say I have an exam or something where I'm a little scared about. And then again, I'm thinking about this exam or this exam. So I'm always in the future. So I'm in the past or in the future. But the mindfulness regulation is that you some sort of attend to the present moment. You're just here and now. Yeah? And you can help having this be through breathing in, breathing out. You have these techniques. Yeah. So to go to be in the present moment. And that's what helps you downregulate these negative ruminations. And that's why you feel better. And this is also when um, through different induction techniques, also then not only for us in stressful situations, very good for everyone, but also what you could, uh, these are complementary techniques that are now being probed and tested. Uh, that, for example, through virtual reality environments where you play video games, you actually also immersed in the present moment and could downregulate all these negative ruminations or in the flotation tank the same thing after 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 a while this inner chatting yeah these ruminations go are, are decreased and or even with uh, psychedelics uh, in re, there in, in in patients with really severe depression for example um, also these psychedelics help in getting people out of these strong ruminations and they feel much better. So you can could say these um, inductions of altered states of consciousness are very important for our health yeah, in, in, let's say, stress-related, in everyday life for everyone, but also in clinical psychology or psychiatry for patients who have severe problems. Uh, but do these methods uh, have restrictions? which patients uh, should not take psychedelics, for example, or should avoid um, this um, meditation practice? Uh, yeah, so that, of course, you, um, you always have to make a differential diagnosis for people. Um, I mean, even speaking of um, uh, people who, have, who are, let's say, not psychiatrically speaking ill or that already there we have people who have to choose their right um, uh, method yeah for example with meditation you really have to be some sort of have some sort of self-regulation capacities already yeah? mm -hmm. that you really stay because you have to meditate over and over again for quite a long time in a session of half an hour maybe and then doing this every other day and you have to stay in this habit of doing it yeah? and some people uh, kind of have problems in maintaining the habit yeah but then for example then you could say oh going into the flotation tank yeah uh, could be a good thing yeah? because the flotation is very safe and you very easily get into something like meditation type uh, um, states but then not that is not good for everyone because some people don't like uh, having the light shut off yeah but this is not the big, biggest problem because you could have something like a little light still on yeah that's so that's also possible yeah? so but then in uh, things like you know if you go to um, uh, differential diagnosis with um, uh, patient groups what one has to make sure, for example, with psychedelics, because psychedelics have a really great impact on, on, on your, um, your mental self, uh, is that uh, what, what people normally do is that they some sort of try and exclude people who have problems also in the family history uh, uh, of with, for example, with psychosis or something. Yeah? Because uh, psychedelics, you could say, this used to be um, uh, an idea that psychedelics are something like a 
inducing a temporary psychosis yeah, for a couple of hours, but where you can get, get out again. And then the danger with psychedelics is that you could some sort of induce a psychosis in some people. So that's, so that's why you have to be very careful. Psychosis is almost uh, equal uh, schizophrenia. Yeah, yeah, so, okay, so exactly. So schizophrenia is like the label for an illness, yeah, which you use for describing certain psychiatric patients. But psychosis is basically a state you are in, which people with schizophrenia um, could also have or have. Um, and so, um, so you have to, but even with meditation, so you always have to be, be careful. People who have problems um, in daily, well, with some sort of traumatic um, history or something, um, what they always, what they normally can do is they can very often cope in daily life with these traumatic experiences because you can, for example, distract yourself. Yeah, so if you don't feel so good, uh, you call someone and talk to him or you watch your favorite uh, TV show or you go you go swimming and, and uh, well, you can distract yourself. But then in these situations, like in the floating tank or in meditation, um, then suddenly you have no means of distracting yourself. So then the trauma actually could come up um, so that's why you have to be actually quite uh, careful um, in certain contexts with certain uh, patient groups. Uh, but that's, of course, then the the, um, the job of the clinician or the psychologist, because uh, any proper treatment can have side effects. Uh, and what you so you cannot say, okay, take the psychedelics, go into the floating tank, do meditation, then all is good. But you have to embed. Uh, these techniques into a greater context, a therapeutic context. So a therapist should be with you. So you analyze the person, you know the person, and then you try stepwise uh, to get people into these states, uh, altered states. For example, my, my colleagues in Tulsa, when they studied uh, patients with anxiety and depression, so they had really patients with severe problems because uh, other um Techniques uh, like meditation or psychopharmacological treatment or psychotherapy, standard psychotherapy, uh, didn't work for these individuals. And only those for which these standard treatments didn't work, they came, were allowed to take part in the study. So you can really see they're very severely, uh, have severe problems for what many are years. Kind of yeah? Uh, depression, depression and anxiety, depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. diagnosed with severe anxiety and depression. And then you get them slowly into the situation. So, for example, you have them lie in the floating tank, but with the lights on. Uh, so they mm -hmm. feel more secure. And then you have the total control over the light. They can shut it off and on. Um, and that's basically how they treated the people. So some people just floated with lights on all the time, but you still have a certain relaxation. Um, other people are, after a while said, oh, I tried with lights off and then it felt fine. And then they had uh, tremendous positive effects uh, after just one hour of float in these patients. And some said, oh, they've never had this state of relaxation and well-being for, for many years, but now for the first time, only after one float. Uh, of course, one has to continue doing studies because this was just one float. And then di directly afterwards, they felt much, much better, better than any time in years. Yeah. But now what the people are doing is like having people come several times a week, let's say two times a week, similar to psychotherapy, where you also have to come once or twice a week and then trying to see what are the effects of several uh, sessions and also long-term effects. Yeah? But these what things have to be published? studied. Was it published somewhere? I yeah, yeah sure. And so this was uh, Feinstein and colleagues, also Ma Martin Polos, who is the director of the institute, in the journal PLOS One. Uh, so if you type Thank in you. Feinstein, Polos, and flotation, then you'll find the um, journal, the journal and the paper. Uh, I have two questions left. So the first question is uh, from my audience: uh, How? Schizophrenic people uh, sense time. Yeah, that's that's a, that, because that's an important question because it's very different to what we find with other patients groups. So, 
what I learned, for example, from my colleague Anne Girsch in Strasbourg, who's a psychiatrist with whom I cooperate, and what she basically how she analyzes, and that's what, how I learned it. But this is there's really a, um, a history of knowledge over the last hundred years concerning this is that they have some sort of the sense of self and time is something like segmented. Yeah? So what people, uh, again, if you interview people with schizophrenia, what they very often say, very similar to uh, what people with depression say, that, oh, the future is somewhere far apart. I don't connect to this future. Um, but uh, if you analyze furthermore uh, subjectively, but also do, and that's what uh, my colleague Angirsch did, uh, looked at uh, experimental results where people had to judge durations is, Overall, if you want to summarize it, is that they have a segmented sense of self. Yeah? They, they don't have this, what we would call, and Thomas Fuchs, uh, a psychiatrist from Heidelberg, uh, uh, says the same, that what we normally feel is an overarching sense of self across time. Yeah? So we are feeling, we're having the feeling of something that just has passed. We have the anticipation of that something will happen in near future. And this is an overall overarching sense of our self in time but uh, these patients with schizophrenia have a much more segmented sense of self yeah that they don't um, feel being connected with themselves even you could say over time yeah? and this is i think this most striking characteristic with a uh, patient with schizophrenia impressive thank you so imagine you have multiple personality and no one of them Feels yeah, multiple personality would be this, uh, having a personality at the same time, but you only realize one maybe. But there mm -hmm. it is, you yourself, your one personality is segmented into bits and you don't feel your connection with yourself anymore. Yeah? With your future self, with your past self. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we lose uh, the connection to us, ourselves, we actually lose the connection with reality, as I understand with space perception and time perception. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you could say so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, how time perception changes with uh, age? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so this has, intuitively, this has been known very often uh, by, by, for hundreds of years. So people, uh, William James in his principal psychologist in 1890, he already talked about this. Yeah? And I think people have always talked about this. Uh, in the sense of, oh, what you feel is the older I get, the faster time passes. Yeah? So this is especially people getting older, yeah, a certain age feel, oh, yeah, compared to, let's say, my youth, my early adulthood, uh, time passes so quickly now. Yeah? And um, and I actually did studies uh, concerning this, uh, and with which are one of my favorite studies also because they... Uh, uh, you can repeat these studies across different people with different countries and you always get the same results, especially for the question of the last 10 years. Yeah? So when we asked people between 14 and 94, yeah? and there was like 500 people we asked with these questionnaires on how time passes, mm -hmm. especially the question of the last 10 years, how fast did the last 10 years pass? Um, you find this increasing of subjective passage of time with age so the older people get the faster subjectively time passes both across the last 10 years yeah. and we first showed this in bavarian and austrian subjects when i was in, in munich and had a, a doctoral student doing this in innsbruck and um, then uh, this was repeated uh, in with people in netherlands and new zealand and then also in japan and latest results also with people from Italy. Yeah? So at least in the industrialized uh, countries, you could say, you have this very constant finding, which is very uh, important because you have this replication crisis in psychology and the cognitive neuroscience that you cannot repeat suddenly your um, results. So, I would so, say in general in science. Yeah, in general, yeah, I could say in general in science. 13% uh, yeah. of studies uh, could be repeated. Yeah, so in, in psychology, at least in experimental psychologies, they did this really systematically and they could show only 38% uh, could be uh, uh, repeated, you could say, the same results. And in social psychology, it was only 20%. Yeah? 
So I'm happy to show that with my first study, which was published in 2005, you had these basically uh, repeated results over the decades, and it still holds. Yeah. So um, and why? What is the, the let's say interpretation? Maybe that's I think is also important. Is and this has something to do with uh, memory, of course. Again, because you have to think about your last 10 years. And the question is, of course, with memory is, as I said at the beginning, the more uh, events you have in memory for a certain time scale or a certain time period, the longer subjective time. And now you could say in, in, in your youth, in childhood, youth, early adulthood, you experience so many things for the first time. You have this novelty effect, which is then specially encoded in, in memory. So you everything's so important and has this uniqueness, this novelty effect. But later, we get more routine, we know the things, and suddenly we realize we're, let's say, for 20 years in the same city, with the same job, with the same friends, everything stays the same. And of course, if you have something that always stays the same, there's no novelty, it hasn't be, hasn't got to be some sort of um, uh, particularly uh, memorized. And so then looking back, let's say, at the a year of routine of the or always going to morning to work and go, coming home and then watching TV. So this because year will pass then much more quickly. And the attention to new things, right? Yeah, yeah. And and this is you know you're talking about the remedy. That's how could you counteract that? Right? Yeah, yeah. How can, could you counteract? The one thing would be that you some try be open for new things. Yeah, try and try new things out. Don't try to. Go get through your routine. Routine is, of course, important also in your daily life because it has something to do with expertise routine. So that's a very important. Yeah, um, But uh, for your episodic memory, at least, which is important, you should have new experiences, different experiences. So. Thank you very much, Mark. I think this is a perfect point to finish our discussion. But anyway, I have more questions for you. <laughs> because type perception, self-awareness, body awareness, time awareness, this is so important in understanding who we are and where we are now, actually. Um, to conclude, please describe what you are doing in three words. Researching time consciousness 